I'll have money wall to wall. I want an old fashioned house with an old fashioned fence and an old fashioned. Mickey and I say hello from Castle Goring. And Mickey says she doesn't want too much of a preamble this afternoon because she wants to go and chill. And so she's saying, Motty, can you just plunge right in, please? So Motty is going to plunge right in. OK, baby girl? OK. Yeah, you can stay here if you want. You can stay here. Joe Hindman says, I oh, don't understand why it matters that William or his staff did or didn't publish stories about Harry having mental health issues. Because Harry has gone on multiple TV programs talking about his own and Meghan's mental health problems. Harry has highlighted his mental health problems to the point of turning them into entertainment by therapy on TV. And every other interview, Harry raises his own mental health problems as a topic. So where's the problem? Well, that's actually, it's okay, honey, you can stay. That's actually a very, very good observation to make. Where is the problem? I'll tell you where the problem is. The problem is that anything Harry does or anything Meghan does, it's okay according to their cohorts. But anybody else who does anything, it's terrible. Having said all of that, Harry does have a right to speak about his mental health problems. And if he wishes to do so, he can. Well, once he has violated his own privacy, and this is the problem with Harry and Meghan, they don't seem to understand that if you violate your own privacy, you cannot then expect everybody to avoid the subject upon which you have been preaching and speaking and hectoring and prevailing. They don't get it. Having said all of that, had Harry had mental health problems that were unknown to anybody, had he not spoken about them, had he wanted to keep them private, had his behaviour been such that there was no need for anybody to inform the public that Harry was actually, shall we say, a few cylinders short of a racing car engine, then he would have had cause for complaint. And his minister of propaganda, Scavy, Scavy, oh, Mickey, and mummy's dying to itch of Scavy, she's itching, she's being driven mad, just the way Marat was driven mad by Scabies. She's being driven mad by Scabies, and so is everybody else. Well, Scabies doesn't have a right to complain about the fact that anybody else spoke about Harry's mental health problems or Meghan's mental health problems when they have spoken about them. They seem to not understand if a subject is off limits, you are on a bound to avoid it unless avoiding it is going to cause huge problems for the person involved or the institution involved, in which case it rarely does become a very dubious area, morally and ethically, as to whether you unmask someone who is trying to be private. But this is not the case. This is not the case. So the problem lies in the fact 
that when Harry and Meghan want to speak about their mental problems, that's fine. When other members of the royal family, the royal household, the institution of the monarchy, the British general public, journalists, commentators, anybody else wishes to speak about Harry and Meghan's mental problems amid scabies comes in with that wonderfully plastic face. Half Meghan, half Jessica Maroon Romy. I mean, you know, years ago, Phyllis Stiller, who was a famous American comedian, I'm sure you Americans will remember who Phyllis Stiller if you're of a certain age as I am. She was a great comedian. Phyllis Stiller was on a program about plastic surgery. And they asked her, because she was well known to be a practitioner of plastic surgery, and they asked her, who, in your opinion, is the best plastic surgeon on earth? And she said, Michael Jackson's plastic surgeon. And they said, why Michael Jackson's plastic surgeon? And she said, well, anybody who can turn a black boy into white girls, the man for me. <laughs> Very naughty joke. Oh. I love to know who certain people's plastic surgeons are so that I would tell my friends, avoid them. Ricky Harcourt says, this situation has taken on the color of a gladiatorial combat. We are watching a predator at work not a human as we know it. We have seen in wildlife films a hungry creature waiting with intent to kill, and the creature we are watching is a me gun. From birth she has got where she has by using one man after another, and this latest one appears to have joined her in the hunt. What a very good observation that is to make. Predator and prey hunting together. Hmm. Pretty good. Attack didn't work, so we have entered stealth. Very well observed. They are going to pretend nice to get our confidence but they will wait and wait. Then, of course, they're going to pounce. It takes time to see the pattern, and it is now clear that we are working on primitive instinct, using tit for tat. Her Majesty the Queen is highly civilized and extremely experienced, and now the royalty machine has entered the contest openly. We can only wait and see if there are bet if sorry, if they are bettered and retreat, slinking away with tall, droopy tails between their legs. What do you think? I think you have your finger firmly on a pulse. And I think that, yes, one technique hasn't worked effectively, so they will try another. I think we are looking at a predator at work. And I think your very prescient observation of predator and prey having joined forces to hunt is very interesting. Unless, of course, they are not really predator and prey. They are predator and predatress. 
and they have joined an unholy alliance as a brilliant folly adder. It will be interesting. It will be very interesting to see what happens. Very. But I suspect that they are regrouping because my information is that they are not particularly successful and they have a wealth of expenses and they have burnt so many bridges that it's not going to be easy to crawl back into the British establishment. It's going to be very difficult. So they are going to have to somehow make a success of America. And my understanding is that for all the beating of the drums and all of the big talk, it's big talk, small action. That means big talk about big bucks, dimes in the bank account, dimes in the bank account. R. Omar says, hello, Lady C, Middle Eastern woman here with very strong opinions about the hustler and her doofus. <laughs> Never heard that one, but I can imagine. Oh, gosh, I do love some of these comments. They're divine. My question is, Is authentic the new old-fashioned? So authentic and old-fashioned are in quotation marks. You know, as in Eartha Kitt's Just an Old-Fashioned Girl's Song, what do you think? Much love. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Sorry. Just an old-fashioned girl. <laughs> I think authentic is the new substitute for old fashioned, as in the Arthur Kick song. I'm just an old fashioned girl who likes old fashioned men and old fashioned diamonds and old fashioned being taken care of. I'm just an old fashioned girl. Yes, I am. Yes. Oh, sorry, I'm authentic. I have an authentic relationship with my multimillionaire or billionaire or prince or whoever he is of higher status than myself. And I love him authentically and organically. I do, I do, I do. And I know he's famous, but I'd never Google him. Oh, no, no, no. I don't want anything like reality polluting oh, our pond. We need to swim in the sea of love. And for us to do that, our pond has to be clear because it is both a pond and the sea, even though there's no such thing as the two of them together. However, we're not going to be bogged down with reality. No, we're not. And we are authentically in love. And we have an authentic authentic life and we have authentic children oh, sometimes delivered authentically by is it FedEx or oh, oh the stork the stork yeah but not the stork club that's been out of business for a while very authentic yes I think my dear I would be in complete agreement with you an authentic girl nowadays is what we used to call an just an old-fashioned girl. <laughs> Joanna MacDonald says, Lady C, I remember reading in the Andrew Morton book that Diana said that she fell out of love with Charles when Harry was born. She said that Charles made a disappointed remark about Harry's red hair. As much as I liked Diana, I remember thinking, A, why would she say that when Harry could read it later on? And B, I thought it was probably the dry sense of humour that is typical of Brits. 
and that he didn't mean it in a disparaging manner. I'm sure that's true. Very well observed. I have to say, I just love how my viewers and comment writers are so, so just with the program and so completely astute. It is such a pleasure. I feel as if we are having a wonderful conversation with people contributing and then I turn back the subjects of interest to. Do you think Harry built a resentment towards Charles for that? No, I don't. I don't at all. I don't think that Harry for a second uh, gave any credence or weight to that sort of comment. Harry's problem, my dear, isn't too small an ego. It's too large an ego. The problem with an overinflated ego is it's like an overinflated balloon. The bigger it gets, is the more fragile it becomes. I don't for a second think that Harry believed any of that. Harry knows his father loves him and Harry knows his mother loved him. Harry knows his grandparents loved him. Harry knows his family has always loved him. These were truths that Harry clung to and used all his life until he met a woman who dropped poison in his ear. It's only then that Harry discovered rather late in the game that what he had loved he now loathed. What he had admired, he now deplores. What he regarded as comfort, he now regards as a bind. What he regarded as um, security, he now regards as entrapment. What he regarded as privilege, he now regards as a pain all under the influence or let's give let's actually not say influence let us use the word that harry would use all under or if not the word the idea all under the ministrations of his educator because we need to remember harry is the most avid worshiper of the cult of Megan. And anything out of that oracle's mouth is regarded by him as completely acceptable and believable. Now, Mickey, you need to remember that the sun rises is in the west and sets in the east. And tomorrow morning, when the sun is rising in the wrong place, you're to get up and bark at it, okay? That's what you're to do. You need to be as reasonable as Meghan and Harry would be. Lindeberg says, Lady C, do you think perhaps that one of the reasons Harry was Diana's pet stems from his being the youngest, the baby as it were? And also because she felt Charles didn't want or was disappointed in him because he wasn't the girl he'd hoped for and even has ginger hair. Diana, by her own admission, felt that she was a disappointment and had been hoped to be the replacement for the boy her parents had lost in infancy. I'd be most interested in your thoughts. Thanks much. This is a very interesting take on things, I've got to say. But I can't agree with it. I'm sorry. I think, according to everybody who knew those children when they were small, and knew them really well, Harry was very affectionate and loving. William was above a boy. William was called the Basher 
because William was far more aggressive than Harry. So I think that just there alone, because Harry was very cuddlesome and Diana's marriage broke up when Harry was a baby, in fact, an infant. And I think that she most likely clung to him as a comfort blanket. And she used to actually say that she found him a great comfort and used to love to curl up looking at the television with Harry in the afternoon, sometimes to such an extent that she would allow him to stay home from school. So she actually was encouraging him to be naughty, but she did it because she was hungry for affection and he was a very affectionate child. I think it's as simple as that. I think that Charles's comment about the baby being a ginger was just an idle comment that didn't mean anything. It wasn't pejorative. I think it was just as the previous questioner observed. A droll British throwaway comment that meant nothing. Had Charles had something against gingers, he wouldn't have married into a ginger family, would he? He wouldn't have gone out with the ginger's eldest sister because Sarah Spencer, when Charles took her out, was a flaming redhead. Diana was never a redhead, although she was surrounded by gingers and redheads, but Sarah was a flaming redhead. That didn't put off Charles. He went out with two sisters and married one of them. So I don't think that we should stretch the prejudices too far because I think there's no point in overdoing things. And of course then, Diana never had another child with Charles, which is hardly surprising because by her own account, he wouldn't touch her after uh, he discovered that she had had an affair with Barry Manneke and he wasn't touching her before because he had withdrawn from her because by Diana's own admission, she had been training Charles up to be the man she wanted. And he, on the other hand, had decided that he couldn't compromise himself out of existence totally. He had compromised himself to the point that if he continued to compromise himself further, that he would have ceased to exist as a valuable individual. And it is ironic that what Diana wanted to achieve with Charles, Harry has willingly given Meghan, which is complete control and domination of his life and turning him from A into B. Very interesting, if you think of it in those terms. Cheryl Bauman says, Lady C, you look lovely. Thank you very much. Do you think Harry and Meghan moved to the USA to have a surrogate? <laughs> it certainly would have made it a lot easier. There would not have been the scrutiny that turned out that there was hair. Uh, they were able to retreat. Of course, COVID helped with that. Uh, do I think they moved to America because it was easier to bring off a surrogacy? I think they moved to America to make money and to increase their profile because I don't think that Meghan is the sort of person who was willing to devote her life to the institution of the monarchy. As her mother Doria used to point out to her, don't give the milk away free. And Meghan was not prepared to cut ribbons and go to banquets with mayors and not be in the newspapers 
every day, several times a week, with stories all about her and how wonderful she is and what a humanitarian she is. She also was not prepared to sacrifice her life without getting a financial reward. Because also she is obviously clever enough to have figured out that she's moved on from everyone else. And if she's going to move on from Harry at some point, which of her track record would have doubtless led her to believe that she well might be tempted to move on come a certain time in the future. She needed to move on with bags full of gold and that was not going to be possible as long as she was in Britain. I think that's why she moved on and I think Anybody thinking of any other reason can come up with several other good collateral reasons as to why it would have suited them to move on, including the fact that if they wanted to go down the surrogate route, it would be much easier to do it in America. Also, in America, the child would be born legitimate, while in England, the child would be born illegitimate. That would have been a consideration had they been going down the surrogate route. I am not for one nanosecond suggesting that they did go down the surrogate route. I am very attached to my reputation and my money, and I do not intend to be disconnected from them, not even by voracious, avaricious, litigious, paralegal living embodiments of, how shall I put it? Well, You've got the message. I don't need to put it any other way. GGZX says, Lady C, a question. Yes, Meghan Markle does have her rights to privacy, etc. about the arrival of her children. Yes, but it isn't up to a point. That point being that her children are in the line of succession because they are born of her body and not from a surrogate. That is where I think some of these rights might waver, in fact. Hmm, you're right. But we're speaking about legal rights here, not moral rights. And the palace would have a moral right if those children were born of a surrogate to have the matter be aired and acknowledged publicly. But they still wouldn't be able to expose anything that the couple wished to keep private. It's a very important to remember that fact. Judith Payne says, if the palace cannot clear up the suspicions surrounding her pregnancies because of the Human Rights Act, why have they placed the two children as seventh and eighth in the line of succession? Surely by doing this, the palace is saying that they were born of her body. Well, Judith Payne, very well observed in terms of the question, but you actually got a very pertinent fact wrong. Harry and Meghan's son, Archie, who was registered by Harry in England as the product of both their bodies is in the line of succession. 
it is unprecedented for an infant to not be put in the line of succession when they are. And little Lily is not a thin line of succession. She is not mentioned in the line of succession at all. Look it up. I made sure I checked it just before doing this video. There is no mention of Lily, Diana, Mountbatten, Windsor in the line of succession at all. I make that observation for what it's worth and I leave you to draw whatever conclusions you care to draw from that fact. I will also make the point while we are on the subject that I am not saying that Archie was born of a surrogate and I am not saying that Lily was born of a surrogate. What I will say, however, is with all of, and I need to say all of that and I emphasize this very clearly for legal reasons. What is really important in all of this is that because of the public speculation, if Meghan and Harry had chosen to have a baby by surrogacy and they had reported the baby as being born of her body and there, and this is all speculative by the way, this is all if, if, if. So I'm not accusing anybody of anything. I'm actually trying to explain various scenarios. Simple. If Harry had innocently reported that the child was born to Meghan, thinking that possibly it's her egg, Possibly they don't realize that this is not America. I mean, it's quite possible because, you know, Harry seems to have lost all knowledge that he possessed before marrying her. And she's a know-it-all. And I'm not so sure that she would have necessarily known the differences. This is hypothesizing, I hasten to point out. And they had innocently reported that the baby had been born of her body when, of, because in America you, you can do it in certain states, but you can't in England. And then it is discovered by them and all the palace. The deed is done. The die is cast. Thereafter, there is a strong incentive for all parties concerned to try to hush up what happened. Each party hushing it up for another reason and a different reason from what the other party's reason was. I'm just hypothesizing and saying what could have happened if they had used a surrogate and didn't know that it, they were obliged by law to actually register the baby. So that's how that child would have come to be in the line of succession. And that would cause a huge problem for the royal family and for the court because once they have discovered that something like this has taken place they of course are going to be very mindful of the fact my gosh we knew nothing about this it's going to compromise our positions oh, cover up cover up cover up that's how cover-ups happen you know but to put it in another context 
if, for instance, a couple is gay and they produce a baby and they know that the father is not the father. But they still register the child. And this used to happen systematically, not only because of men being gay, but also because of women having lovers. It was called the presumption of legitimacy. So there's nothing new about what I'm now describing. The law of presumption of legitimacy was created to really draw a veil over embarrassing situations and to create a degree of civility where exposure would be problematic. I think if we bear all of that in mind, you begin to see had, and I'm not saying that this was so, and I'm not saying that I believe that this was so, but I'm saying had Meghan and Harry used the services of a surrogate, they could have in all innocence registered that child as of their, of her body and of his body. And it might even have been created of their seed and ovum, but it would not have been of her body. And I think you begin to see the drift of this, how the situation might have evolved had she used a surrogate. And I'm not saying she used a surrogate. I hasten to add for legal reasons, I'm not saying she used a surrogate. Dorothy Hewitt says, Lady C, I really enjoy your videos. They are so informative. And I have to say, I agree 100% with everything you say about that disrespectful pair in LA. How can H trash his family like this? He has no love in big block capitals for them, especially his grandmother, our queen. I can see the queen offering an olive branch and inviting them for the celebrations next year. She has a generous heart. A nutbeg may come just so she can stand on the balcony that should not be allowed. They are no longer working royals. I would like to know your opinion on this matter. Thank you. Well, it's a Queen's Jubilee and it's going to be up to her who she asks. It's not in my place to suggest that she doesn't ask her grandson. But, you know, they say a week is a long time in politics. Well, a year is even longer in terms of the, a political institution like the monarchy. So let's see what happens. Also, maybe Meghan will be pregnant again. She might be pregnant again and she might not be able to come. Her doctors might not allow her to fly. You need to remember that could happen as well. Megan is a young woman. She's at the peak of her fertility. She might be pregnant. So just think about that. I mean, you know, they could have, even though they only wanted to, they could have accidentally conceived a third. These things happen. I hope and suspect it might actually happen that if they do come, the balcony might be pared down to just those in direct line of the throne. It becomes more problematic if all of the other members of the family are on the balcony accept them. That becomes a real slap in the face. And that becomes actually uncivilized conduct. But the royal family is caught between the, the devil and the deep blue sea because they know that the public don't want Harry and Meghan on that balcony. They know it. And they don't want to displease the public. So 
But as I said, a year is a long time. Let's see what happens. But will Megan come? <sighs> Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Yes, I am. Mr. DeMille, my close-up. I'm ready for it. Yes, I am. Yeah, I am. And I'm even going to wear a cocktail dress so that if I'm on the balcony, everybody's going to be able to say, gosh, doesn't Megan look fabulous? I mean, look at her. She's in evening wear in the middle of the day. So classy. She's just classy with a capital K. Her spelling being as good as her taste. Mary Vaughan Foyle says, Is Scabies doing it only for money? He seems to hate the royals and the monarchy as much as Harry, and he seems to want revenge as much as Harry. His rage echoes the al -Fayeds. Is he connected to them? When Meghan said on Oprah that a senior royal had mentioned the skin colour of Archie, for me she was pointing at William, because her aim is for Harry to replace William, because as Scabies said, Meghan comes from a culture where if you work hard enough you get to the top. She is aiming at Lilibet's job, and she has her strategy in place to achieve her end. Well, I think it's a little bit unfair to bring in the Fayette's name because I, from time to time, see Mohammed Al Fayette's wife, who I like enormously. She is lovely. And I've met the daughter, etc. Oh, very pretty girl, by the way. And I have very mixed reports of Mohammed Fayed. And I actually think he was given a very harsh time. I also think that his bitterness was explicable, if not justifiable. And I certainly don't believe what some of what he said, I, some of his bizarre utterances, I think, you know, you'd have to be a flat earthist to accept them as scientific fact, let's put it that way. But let's keep Mohammed Fayed out of it and the Fayeds, because it was only ever Mohammed Fayed, none of the other Fayeds, none of the children, not his wife, only Mohammed Fayed. And I do know that he has never got over Dodie's death. I know this from members of his family, that he is to this day grief stricken at the loss of his son. So I'm cutting him a little bit of slack here. Having said that, is Scabies doing it only for the money? Well, he's certainly doing it for the money and he's certainly building himself a reputation. I happen to think it's a very undesirable reputation. I certainly wouldn't want it. But he's building it and he's doubtless making himself money and you know, some people don't care what they're famous for. As long as they're known, they don't care. Some people, there's no difference between fame and infamy. There's no difference between being popular and being unpopular. They don't care. As long as they're not ignored, as long as they are acknowledged, they think, oh, I'm special. I'm special. So I can't do plasticity beyond that. I'm sorry. You know, I have the face God gave me. Oh, no plastic surgery on the nose, mouth, eyes, chin. I'm sorry. Cheekbones, forehead. What you see is what God created. Yes. I don't think that's true of other people necessarily. <laughs> I also think that this whole nonsense of the skin colour is something we may as well just 
move on from because if it plays well for Meghan, Scabies and Harry to accuse William, they will be accusing William. If it plays well to accuse Charles, they will be accusing Charles. At the moment, it looks as if they have been shaping up to have William very firmly in their sights. And yes, I have no doubt that if William dropped dead tomorrow and his children along with him, God forbid, that Harry and Meghan would be over like a shot. And I can tell you something, you wouldn't believe the vault farce as he was trapped in luxury and privilege and duty. And she was happy to sacrifice all the money she could merch so that she would be queen one day and that her son would be king one day. King Archie Bunker. <laughs> Poor child. I mean, really, I feel sorry for those children. Cindy Chevalier says, It is very interesting that the sixth wife wants to be treated as a human being, but she chooses to treat everyone else as less than so. Why is it she is able to lie about the royal family without any consequences, yet the palace will not say anything regarding her pregnancies. Well, we have already established why the whole area of Meghan's pregnancies are off limits where the palace is concerned. And you know, the monarchy has to behave decently. Otherwise, people would lose respect for it. Sometimes when you're decent, it takes a little bit longer to prevail. But my experience has been patience is a virtue. And one of the keys to life is to sometimes play the longer, if not the long game. If only fools rush in where wise men and angels fare to tread. Harry and Meghan have rushed in. They've already played all their major cards. Just think about it. And as I have said before, the fight back has started. It's just being done in a civil and civilized and respectful and correct manner. There is a correct way of behaving. You know, in the old days when people used to fence, there were rules regarding fencing. There were even rules regarding dueling. You might shoot to kill, but you did it within certain boundaries. Harry and Meghan have no boundaries. There's nothing admirable about having no boundaries. And the fact that the royal family has boundaries and that they are behaving in a way that shows that they have boundaries doesn't mean that nothing is being done. It simply means that it's going to take longer. You know, it doesn't need a knockout blow. All it needs is a denouement, something final that is going to put an end to things. But that is going to take time. And in the meantime, Harry and Meghan have exposed themselves in front of the world. Yes, they have their supporters. But if I were a pollster, I would actually be laying down good money on the fact that every time they open up their mouths, they lose supporters. Rachel Nguyen says, Hello, Lady C. I read recently the final show for Harry and Meghan was when the Queen refused them permission to set up their own household, the same as William and Kate. What exactly does this mean, though? Well, 
what it means is that Harry and Meghan setting up their own household meant their own operation that they would then be invited to do things, that they would have secretaries, that they would have assistants, or that their calendars would be set, that their diaries would, would be dealt with, that their everyday royal duties and other matters would be dealt with by their staff. Well, Harry and Meghan, the royal family, already knew that they were pushing the envelope in terms of wanting to embark upon commercial deals that were unacceptable and that they also wanted to involve themselves in political activities that were unacceptable. Had they been allowed to set up their own household, they would have been much more autonomous than they were when their household was put under the remit of Buckingham Palace. They could be observed and they didn't want to be observed. Now, if they had been functioning for the good of the monarchy, and for the welfare of the state, since everybody else in the royal family is prepared to listen to advice and to be only autonomous up to a point, even when they are allowed autonomy, they have to take advice. Why did Meghan and Harry A want total autonomy and no willingness to take any advice whatsoever, but scream down the palace with saying that what they wanted to do, they should be allowed to do. Destructiveness. You know, we all in life have to abide by boundaries. And people who do not abide by boundaries are seriously disordered and destructive. And that's why they wanted to leave, to make money and to increase their fame and to be able to go on Oprah and misremember things and misfactualize and misrepresent and mistake and misappropriate and miss everything except treachery. They wanted to do it, they did it. The family couldn't stop them from going once they made up their minds they wanted to go. They try to stop them from destroying themselves and damaging the institution of the monarchy. This was not because they were being mean and nasty. This was because they understood that Harry and Meghan were going to behave destructively and that what they wished to do was unacceptable. It wasn't a bolt for freedom. It was a bolt for farcicality. It was a bolt for misrepresenting the institution. It was a bolt for damaging the institution. It was a bolt for damaging themselves. And I am afraid that people who don't see this are very immature or very stupid or very naive. Michelle Zekely says, I really hate hearing British reporters and whoever else trying to explain her bullying as a simple cultural difference. News flash, we in America do not condone poor, vile behavior. We do not bully staff or anyone else. Nadia, 
Thank you so much for saying it. So well said. Because I think it's a crock of rubbish that Harry and Meghan's misbehavior is being massaged away on the grounds of cultural differences. Yes, as I explained in my book, there are significant cultural differences and they do impact upon conduct and attitude. But the basic American and the basic Britisher who are decent both understand what decency is about. They also understand what treachery is about. They also understand it is completely unacceptable to set yourselves up as humanitarians at the very moment that you are trashing your own family, both maternal and paternal, on his side, and her father especially. I don't think there's any excuse for bullying where culture, and it, I do not think that saying that the difference is cultural washes at all. I couldn't agree more. And on that note, I will say thank you very much for listening. I hope you have enjoyed this. If you have, please like, share, subscribe, press the notification bell, and please keep on asking the questions in the comments section and giving me your opinions as well, because they are invaluable. Thank you very much and goodbye.